Hi, my name is Dan and I'm a mental health pharmacist and today I wanted to talk about what a clinical pharmacist does. But before I get into what I do as a clinical pharmacist, I wanted to provide some historical context to show how clinical pharmacy developed. Three major changes in the field of pharmacy allowed clinical pharmacy to blossom. These are changes in work responsibilities, changes in the education of pharmacists, and postgraduate training. Starting with the changes in the work responsibilities, I wanted to go back to 1965. So imagine you were a pharmacist in 1965. The practice of pharmacy had changed very little over the past 50 years. The major roles of the pharmacist used to be preparing and distributing drug products. So for example, compounding was a much bigger role of the job back then, meaning powders were crushed, things were combined, medications were turned into liquid, flavorings were added, things like that. But work responsibilities changed drastically when the pharmaceutical companies began to supply fully ready to go, fully manufactured products. So the pharmacist no longer had to spend significant time, significant amounts of their day compounding and um, creating the drug products. They had more time to focus on other things. And this time, this time to focus more on clinical things is one of the reasons clinical pharmacy started to develop. So clinical pharmacy is be believed to have its roots out of the University of Michigan. So many students there in the 1960s began to do more clinical roles. One student by the name of David Burkholder um, went on to graduate the University of Michigan and founded the first academic drug information center at the University of Kentucky. So drug information centers provide a resource to prescribers and physicians that they can call and ask questions about medications or see if there's interactions or that sort of thing. So drug information centers are certainly still a part of clinical pharmacy, but it's just one area currently. There's a lot other directions that clinical pharmacy has taken. The second big change in the field of pharmacy that allowed for clinical pharmacists to develop is changes in education. So in 1975, there was a commission that got together called the Millis Commission. And they were they got together to decide where what the future of pharmacy would be, what changes in pharmacy they wanted to see happen. And in essence, they concluded that pharmacy was heading in this clinical route and they wanted to change the education of pharmacists. So to focus less on chemistry, compounding, those sorts of things, and focus more on patient interactions and talking to people in the clinical aspect. So of course, chemistry and compounding is still a component of pharmacy school, but it's not the major component. There's more than just that. So pharmacy schools began to change their education and their degree to the PharmD degree, the Doctorate of Pharmacy degree. And by 1992, the PharmD degree became mandatory. That's what all pharmacy schools have when they graduate students. So for example, every student that's graduated since 1992 has a PharmD degree, whereas students before 1992 may or may not have a PharmD degree. They may have a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy degree. The final component that contributed to the rise and the growth of clinical pharmacy is postgraduate training. So compare this to um, medical school or a physician compared to pharmacy. So traditionally, once pharmacy school was completed, the pharmacist would start practicing right away. But as compared to medical school, once doctors first graduate, they're residents and they work under an attending physician who has years of experience and they learn from them. So pharmacy decided to adopt some of that and um, make residencies an option. That being said, there are still many routes in pharmacy that don't require postgraduate training. So you can graduate pharmacy school and start, and start working right away as an independent pharmacist, but um, there's also the option to do residency. So it can be one year, it can be two years, there's fellowships, there's many options for postgraduate tra training. Um, what, a, what a residency does is it allows for pharmacists to gain a lot of clinical experience in a short period of time. So like I was saying, uh, the first year of residency is generally a general residency where the pharmacy resident gets to experience many different areas of pharmacy. So they might round with a 
pharmacist in the emergency department, and then they might round with a pharmacist in an intensive care unit, and so on. So uh, the biggest downside to residencies is pay, is cost, quite literally. So the average pharmacy resident makes $42,000 per year, um, whereas if you start working as an independent or a, a fully-fledged pharmacist right away, you generally make more than $42,000 per year. That being said, residencies are on the rise. So in 2000, there were around 600 residency programs, and there are over 2,600 2, residency programs today. So more and more pharmacists are choosing to take that pay cut, to have that experience, and, and hopefully advance their career. Then after the first year of general residency, there is a choice to do a second year of residency that's more specialized. So much like physicians specialize in an area, they're a family medicine provider, they're internal med, they're a psychiatrist, they're an oncologist, pharmacy provides these options as well, generally through residencies, but there's other paths as well that you can become a specialist in a certain area. So a second year of residency um, allows the pharmacist to specialize in a certain area and really learn about the medications, the patients, and that field. So for example, after pharmacy school, I did two years of residency. My first year was a general one where I got to learn all different sorts of areas. And my second year was all in psychiatry and a little bit of neurology. So many um, hospitals have dedicated clinical pharmacists in multiple areas. So this allows many pharmacists to be experts in one certain area rather than having many pharmacists be relatively knowledgeable in a bunch of areas. So it's more like each pharmacist is a laser beam rather than having all the pharmacists be a bright floodlight or flashlight or something like that. So these three changes in pharmacy, um, so the changes of the work responsibilities changing historically, the education changing to be more clinical, and then postgraduate training flipped the script in pharmacy a little bit. So previously, um, for example, in a hospital, a provider or a physician would write the medication order and it would either be faxed or brought down to the pharmacy. Nowadays, it's all electronic. Um, it would be brought to the pharmacy. The pharmacist would review the order and if there was any issue with it, they would then have to call up to the floor, try to reach the physician, try to reach the prescriber, and um, talk about what was wrong with the order, what they thought should be changed. And that is a um, reactive approach. So you're reacting to the things that come about rather than what happens today is more of a proactive approach. So by having the clinical pharmacist up there on the floor in their area of the specialty, um, they can prevent the order from ever making it to the pharmacy incorrect. So rather than the physician makes the or writes the drug order, it goes to the pharmacy, there's something wrong with it, it takes time to circle back and figure out the issue. Nowadays, the pharmacist is up there with the physician, making the helping to make the decision to begin with so that everything flows much um, smoother. So um, those, all those changes added, added up to change pharmacy and hospitals from being reactive to proactive, which is more efficient, as you would guess. So with the rise of clinical pharmacy, what does a clinical pharmacist do? So first, I'll walk you through my typical day as a clinical pharmacist, and this is just me personally, so there's many different specialty areas, and clinical pharmacists might have different roles, but I'll talk about what I do. So I typically get to my office at around 8 a.m., I pull up the electronic health record and I go through all the patients that are on the inpatient psychiatric unit. So I'll read them, their notes, I'll look at their lab values, I'll look at their medications, I'll look at their as needed medications to see if they received any of those, and I'll start typing up a list of my recommendations, things that can be optimized. Maybe there's a drug-drug interaction, maybe there's something that can be changed. Then at 9.15, interdisciplinary rounds start. So the psychiatrists are there, but also nursing representatives, also OT, sometimes PT, sometimes social work. There's many different fields that are involved with the patients there, so we can all collaborate and talk about what's best for the patient. 
So as we talk about the patients, I make my recommendations to the, the team, again, trying to optimize the um, medications and anything else that I'm able to help with. After rounds, I'll talk with some of the patients if there's something that's unclear or I have to clarify a dose or I have to see if they've had any issues with any medications, I'll do a little bit of that. Then I try to help the nursing staff as best I can, get some medications from the pharmacy, um, get access to medications, that sort of thing. Then I leave the unit, the inpatient unit, and I have some outpatient responsibilities. So outpatient means when the patients are no longer in the hospital and coming up for routine follow-up care. So I have um, some patients that I'll see in an outpatient psych psychiatric clinic for follow-up. We'll talk about medications, adjust medications, um, and, and I'll follow up to make sure that they're doing okay in the long run. Um, I also have some academic roles, so I work on lectures, I work on teaching, some other things, and I'll have students and residents and those sorts of things with me, so I'll try to provide that education to them to continue clinical pharmacy. So clinical pharmacists fill a lot of roles in the hospital, but there are some commonalities when we make recommendations. And a few of the most common, ac commonly accepted recommendations that a clinical pharmacist make are monitoring therapy, um, requesting drug levels to be drawn, um, and actually stopping medications. So people think as pharmacists sometimes as like pill pushers or people who are all about medications, and we are all about medications, but like I was saying, one of the most commonly recommended recommendations is to stop medications. So we really like the appropriate use of medications, and sometimes medications can fall through the cracks and that sort of thing, so we want that appropriate, correct use. Clinical pharmacists also have a big, big impact. So um, clinical pharmacists participating in medical rounds in hospitals were found to reduce preventable adverse drug reactions by 60 to 78% as compared to services that don't have a clinical pharmacist. So this translates to life savings. And another study I was looking at estimated that pharmacists save the lives of 112 senior citizens every year in the United States. So huge numbers, uh, huge quality of life differences. And these benefits add up to cost savings as well. So for certain conditions, every $1 spent on pharmaceutical care um, translates to saving the healthcare system $3.98. So adverse events lead to issues, lead to increased hospital stays, lead to a lot of monetary issues. So having that um, clinical pharmacist there can help save lives, save money, uh, help the patients, help the team feel more comfortable. So in summary, three major things cause the development of clinical pharmacists. These are work responsibilities changing, these are changes in the education of pharmacists, and these are um, postgraduate training programs for pharmacists. And then after that, you heard what I do as a clinical pharmacist and what many other pharmacists do and how important some of these services are. So they save lives, they save money. So I hope that was helpful in learning about what a clinical pharmacist does. And thank you so much for watching.